So if you have your Bible, I hope you do. If not, we have Bibles, or I'm sure you can download it on your phone. Um, John chapter 17 this morning. And um, I actually uh, didn't tell you guys, but we're actually having a prayer meeting today. Um, this, uh, this whole passage is just Jesus praying. And so um, it's going to be It's going to be good. Um, and we're going to, hopefully I'll get through all the verses. I studied for all the verses, so we'll see what time allows. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much just for this morning, Lord, and just for your heart for us as your people, as we're going to see here this morning. You have certain desires for us um, to grow us, to, to get to know us better, to grow us closer to you, to, for us to get to know you better. And so this morning, as we open up your word, Lord, your truth, Lord, I pray that... Um, all distractions would be set aside and we could just focus in on you and what you have to say to us, Lord. You're the great God who created us and you know us individually and you know what we need to hear this morning. And so I pray that we're listening, that our hearts will be soft, and whatever the message might be to us. Maybe it's, it's encouragement, maybe it's conviction, Lord. But I pray no matter what, your truth would come out. So in your name we pray, amen. So John chapter 17, and um, as we've been seeing really with the last few chapters with the book of John, we see that this is really Jesus' last night. I mean, yeah, I believe it starts in, in chapter 14, um, uh, and uh, yeah, no, in, in chapter 13, um, it really begins Jesus' last night here on this earth, and but before he goes to the cross to die, and so from 13, now we're into 17, and, and it's going to continue on even to 18. This is just one night of Jesus talking to his disciples, giving him the last, uh, you know, it, it's like the locker room speech before they go on out to the field to go into battle. Um, and so we've been seeing how interesting it is when Jesus has been talking to his disciples. He hasn't been saying it's going to be horrible, although he has been real with them and told them, look, the world will hate you because it's hated me. And you will have trials But he's been trying to encourage his disciples. Because he, in, their, in their minds, he is giving them the worst news possible. That he's leaving. And he keeps bringing it up. <laughs> I mean, the disciples probably at this point are like, Look, Jesus, we understand. You, you keep saying you're leaving. You don't have to keep rubbing it in our face. <laughs> keep telling us that. But in the last chapter, chapter 16, uh, last week, Jesus finished his final, um, what you would call his discourse to his disciples. And now he ends his ministry on earth by praying to the Father. And at the same time, chapter 16 and 17, there really is no break. You know, it, it's almost like Jesus finished his sermon. And just like we do at the end of a sermon, we pray at the end of a sermon. You know, kind of put the um, icing on the cake, <laughs> if you will. And right in front of, of his disciples, after he finishes saying all these things to them, he prays. And this prayer is actually constantly regarded as one of the greatest prayers in the Bible. You know, and that's subjective. But also, it is the longest recorded prayer in the New Testament. There's many, many prayers throughout the Bible. Abraham, Solomon, um, David. In the New Testament, there's, there's many prayers as well. But this is the longest recorded prayer in the New Testament. Um, and as we dive into this prayer that Jesus prays to the Father, we will continue to see his love and care for his disciples. And more than that, we'll see his desire for the church, for his church. So in verse 1, the very first part of verse 1, chapter 17 of John, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, and we're going to stop there for a second. As I just said, Jesus just concluded all that he wanted to say to his disciples and now he takes time to speak to the Father. He's finally given them everything that, that he knows that they need to hear from him. And so now he's going to pray to the Father. And honestly, Jesus is the great example that we have of an intimate prayer relationship with the Father, which is very interesting because you would think like the Son and the Father and, and really the two are one. So why would Jesus need to always take this time to pray to the Father if he already knows his will, if he's doing everything that the Father is, has told him to do, he's fulfilling it. I mean, obviously he's not struggling with sin. And so why does Jesus always need to go to the Father to pray? Because we see that throughout his ministry. He's always just kind of, you know, 
one minute he's walking with the disciples and he kind of just takes a step back in, into the bushes and takes a moment to pray and then all of a sudden someone finds him. He's in the bushes, you know? And then, ah, all right, you know. But I think when you look at the life of Jesus, and the book of John, um, you know, definitely shows it, but when you read all of the Gospels, you really see Jesus' heart to get alone with the Father, to pray with the Father, to speak with the Father. And a lot of times, those times are interrupted. Again, as I said, you know, he goes, tries to go pray, and then every, the multitudes find him. You know, they send spies to find where he's praying so they can bother him. You know, and if, if you have kids or, you know, had kids when you're little, it's the same thing. You try and take a moment to read your Bible and pray and, there's dad, get him, <laughs> jump on him. It's very similar. Or, or just your phone starts buzzing, someone walks by, asks you a question, whatever it might be. But I think it's also an important lesson that, you know, we, we need to pray as much as we can, but, you know, if... if <laughs> Sometimes we think, hey, if I'm not praying three hours a day, consistently, on my knees, door closed, that, you know, the Lord's not hearing me, I'm not doing good enough. I think, you know, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, 5.18, to pray without ceasing. And I don't think he means to constantly live on our knees. And Sorry, boss, I can't give you that report. I've got to pray. But just to live, live in a life of prayer constantly talking to the Father, having an open line to the Father. You're walking down, you're walking in the grocery store and the Lord puts someone on your heart. Maybe you see them at the grocery store and they duck because, you know, they don't want to talk to you. Hey, Lord, pray for that person real quick. Not like, I actually was a, when I was working at Kroger, it was, it was during the Irma um, frenzy and I was trying to get down one of these aisles with my cart. I have, when I was at Kroger, I had a big cart and so when I was uh, trying to get down the aisle, and um, this older gentleman was uh, uh, talking to this, uh, this younger mom with her son who was deaf, and um, um, he thought it w- appropriate to block the whole aisle um, for about 10 minutes to pray over the child. And, um, you know, it, 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 was a, it was like, oh, I was like sitting there, and I was like, man, that, that's a, I'm glad he has that heart to pray for the child, but, you know, you're blocking. People are trying to get water, trying to get, you know, supplies they need for the, the hurricane. And, and, um, uh, but all that to say is, is we don't have to do that. We can just, you know, maybe step aside or, or we can just in our, in our own hearts, in our own minds, pray to the Lord. It doesn't have to be this formal, you know, thing with the Lord. And, and, I'll, and we see this in this prayer today. And I think, again, Jesus' prayer life is the reason that we need one. Why do I need to pray for them? Well, Jesus took time to. And he was perfect. And I know that's none of our records. And so we need it just as much. I think it's also interesting how he prays. We see in that first part of verse 1, it says he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said. He had his eyes lifted to heaven. He's looking, eyes open, you know. Instead of the usual how we do it in the West, heads bowed, eyes closed, hands folded. You know, it, it, it's funny, even with our boys, Cyrus, we'll, we'll, we'll pray at the dinner table and after we're done with the prayer. Everett had his eyes open during prayer. Well, how did you know? I saw it with your eyes open. You know, and, uh, and sometimes we can get so caught up in how we pray. Like, I got to do it this way. Hands folded, eyes closed. Bow, you know, I got, we got to hold hands. We got to do this. We got to do that. Instead of just focusing on, hey, I just need to pray. (laughs) And so, again, I I encourage you, if you don't have a prayer life, and what I mean by that is, if you don't have a constant time that you're praying to the Lord, you're talking to the Lord, because that's really what it is. It's not a formal, um, because we're his sons and daughters now. We don't have to come in, you know, kissing the floor and never being able to look up. and We're his sons and daughters, and as... Hebrews says we can enter boldly into the throne room of grace. And as Jesus even told his disciples, hey, look, you ask the good Father for things and he'll give it to you. So having a prayer life is not this formal thing. It's just talking to the Lord and letting him talk to you. So continuing on in verse 1, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son 
that your son, may, son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus here knows that soon after he speaks this prayer, Judas and the mob will come into the garden to wrongfully arrest him. In fact, when you, at the end of this chapter, right, and you jump into chapter 18, and when you look at the, the, it's hard to say this word, chronology of everything, um, it kind of is bang, bang, bang. Jesus finishes his prayer. They go to the garden. We know in the garden he continues to pray. But this is, again, this is all the same night. And so he tells them, Father, my hour has come. The hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. When he is praying for this, Jesus prays these, these few verses here. He's actually praying for himself, which is, again, interesting. It's something that a lot of times is counterintuitive to what we think about prayer. We can often think that it's selfish to pray for ourselves. And I've even heard Christians refuse prayer from others because they don't want to be perceived as self-centered. You know, I actually had a friend one time, a good friend of mine, um, who I, I was asking him. I knew he was struggling. And so I asked him, I said, hey, you know, can, what can I pray for you for? Um, and he goes, don't waste your breath praying for me. There's other people like people in Africa and India and all that that need, need, your, need the prayers, not me. And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't because he had a heart for Africa or a heart for India or the, the people in poverty or the people dying. It's because he thought that, hey, you know, praying for me is not, you know, that, that's, that'd be prideful, that'd be selfish. And again, we see Jesus here, he's actually praying for himself. And actually, when Jesus encouraged his disciples to pray throughout the Gospels, many times when he told the disciples how to pray, what to pray, it was for themselves. He was saying, you should pray for yourselves for this. Pray for yourselves for that. And we can sometimes get in this, this thing of... of uh, we're more holy if we don't ask people to pray for us. That we're kind of, you know, things will, people will think that we've got things going on better if we're not asking for prayer. In fact, you know, to be honest, I, when, when I was uh, preparing to be, uh, be the pastor and everything, um, you, you, have, you have a million people telling you what you need to do, how to do it, where to do it, what's, what needs to be done. Um, millions of books, tons of teachings. And in some of the this, this resources, people, and things um, that I heard was, you know, hey, as the pastor, you know, you don't want to, like, ask people for prayer because then they'll think you're weak and blah, blah, blah. And um, I was like, I don't think that's what Jesus said. <laughs> or the, the Bible says. And I mean, we have all these people. Look at the, all these people around us right now a desire to pray for us. I mean, we have the, the prayer chain, you know, the, uh, the email that gets sent out. You know, anytime someone has a prayer request and they want everyone to know, you know, honestly, utilize that. Because w- when I receive it, when I, I know when other people receive it, they get that, boom, that's a reminder. I'm, I'm going to take two seconds real quick just to pray for whatever this email is saying. And maybe, you know, for others, I know that they're following up with those, hey, well, how's so-and-so? Did you hear about this? Did you hear about that? I'm going to call them. I'm going to text them. Oh, I found out this. And, 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 you know, sometimes with one prayer request, there ends up being like four or five emails because we're getting updates. We're getting this. We're getting that. Or we're finding out more. Instead of just coming to church and saying, oh, everything's going okay. It's hard to pray for someone when they're okay. Or they're fine. But it's, it's not selfish. In fact, it's an act of humility. 
to, to come before the Lord and say, Lord, I can't. I'm ruining it. <laughs> I'm messing up. I need your help. It's, it's an act of humility to, to go to someone and say, look, I have been struggling with this. I need, I need prayer in this. Now, granted, you know, I get it. We don't want to go to everyone with our problems. <laughs> I'm not going to ask people to come up here and share all their deepest, darkest struggles. But there should be people that we have that we can go to. And maybe even not people, but we have our Father in Heaven who we can go to. If anything. If that's all we have, that's, that's more than enough. So again, Jesus here is even teaching us that of how to pray. He's even giving his disciples, his disciples an example of how to pray. And so he asked the Father to glorify him, that his Son may glorify the Father. And again, this is re- re- um, referring to his resurrection from the dead. Because when God resurrected Jesus from the grave, that was his sign of approval, his stamp of approval, that the sacrifice was, was good, was satisfactory, his all of his wrath was poured out, and there's no more wrath meant for anyone who's found in Jesus Christ. And then in verse 2, Jesus again confirms and, and proclaims to his disciples as he's praying that he is not just a great prophet, but he is God in flesh. He says, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Only God has authority over all flesh. And it is only God that can give eternal life. This wasn't just a, like a, a hand-me-down. A, as we've said before, Jesus wasn't just an assistant representing God. I'm here on behalf of God. No, he was God in the flesh. The same nature. And then in verse 2, and a lot of times we, we can read this and um, kind of miss what Jesus is saying here. A little, little tag that Jesus is saying about us. Jesus refers to those that are saved as gifts from God to him. That God has given Jesus us. D.A. Carson says that Christians often think of Jesus as God's gift to us. Which is true. But we rarely think of ourselves as God's gift to Jesus. This is how Jesus views us, just like a parent does their child. As a gift sent from God. And again, I think Jesus is going to speak very highly of us in these, this chapter. Um, which, is, which is good, it's encouraging. But then he, and then he continues on and, and he, you know, we're shown how he views us and that we're a gift. But the way to have eternal life, to be that gift, to get that gift, is described in verse 3. We need to experientially know God, not just hear about him or know about him. We've talked about that before. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We've talked about this many times. And to be honest, this is going to seem like a a big overview of what Jesus has been saying since chapter 13. But again, knowing his disciples and knowing us, we forget easily, don't we? (laughs) And so it's good that that Jesus is here um, telling us this. But we need to experientially know him, know his character, know about him, have a relationship with him. And we've talked about that. There's a knowledge of God. Because as James says, even the demons believe in God and they tremble. But we know the demons are not going to be in heaven. I wouldn't want to go there. (laughs) But it's having the experiential, the relationship of knowing who God is and his character. Saying, no, he is Lord, he is creator, he is God, he is over me. So the demons and the devil, they know that God exists. They know who he is. But they don't want to, even though they have to submit to it, they don't want to proclaim his lordship over them. That's why they're not in heaven anymore. They're fallen angels. Jesus also speaks like God spoke to Israel in the New Testament as we continue on in verse 4. Jesus says that he's finished the work which you've given me to do, 
which is interesting because he hasn't died yet, right? He hasn't died. He hasn't risen from the dead. He hasn't ascended back into heaven. But he says, I've already finished the work. It's already done. It's already completed. And see, that's how God sees it. God's not bound by time. God's not bound by, well, it hasn't been finished yet because it's not tomorrow. God's outside of the, t- the realm of time. What we see as beginning or hasn't started yet, he sees as finished. And you know, I can say that, but I don't, and, I, and we can sit there and nod our heads and say amen, but you will never understand that. Because our whole life we've been bound, just the fact that we have life, we've been bound by time. There's never a moment in life that we're not bound by time, so we have no idea what that even means. And that's just one of the characters of God. And that's what makes God God and us not. <laughs> so I wish I could, I could give you the definite example and application to that. But that's just what the Bible teaches. He's outside of time. But if you remember in the Old Testament, we've seen this even in the book of Judges on Wednesday nights. When God spoke to Israel, he says, I have already given you the victory. I've already given you in them into your hands and you know whoever you're speaking to joshua or any of the deliverers and judges they're like well i haven't even stepped foot on the battlefield yet how have i already won how is the victory already mine and it's the same thing for us as believers because jesus because of jesus god views us as perfect as righteous as holy because when he views us he doesn't view us he views his son who's completed the work. But we sit down here and we can say, well, I know that I'm a sinner. I'm still sinning. I know that tomorrow I'll probably sin or next week or next month or for sure next year. It's going to happen. So how can God view me as, as, as perfect? It's the same thing. God, God already sees it as done. Again, I, I wish I could say, doesn't that make sense? <laughs> it kind of doesn't, but again, God never asks us to fully understand what he's doing or what he's done. He's asked us to believe on him, trust in him. And then he says that in verse 5, that, that and now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. See, in order for Jesus to come and die for our sins, he had to come down and dwell among us as one of us. He couldn't just come down from heaven, you know, on the day that he was supposed to be crucified, kind of float above the cross, kind of hang out in the grave for three days, and then come back out. No, he had to, he had to start out as a little child. Humility of that. Changing the Lord's diaper. He had to do that. He had to let... People do that. You know, probably like dirty, sinful people hold them and rock them to sleep. And he had to hang out with other kids his age. He's, in, in, in the Gospels, it says that he submitted himself to Mary and Joseph as their child. The Lord, sub- I mean, that, I don't get that. <laughs> I mean, if you had kids, you know that they know everything, right? They know better than you. They know everything already, especially when they're like 16, 17. When I was 16, I did know everything. Um, trust me. You can ask me when I was 16. I knew everything. So, um, But in this case, Jesus did know everything. <laughs> I mean, he could have just like, he could have ruled that house. But he submitted Submitted to the authority that God had put, that he had voluntarily went under. In Hebrews 2.9, the, the author of Hebrews says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Again, might taste death. Because death never fully had control over him. Because three days later, boom, he was out. Again, we see the humility 
in the example of Jesus humbling himself for us. That was the only way to do it, for us. And then he says, he asked God to give him the same glory as the Father. And as God stated in Isaiah, he shares his glory with no one. He said that a couple times in the book of Isaiah. Which would mean, if Jesus is asking God for the same glory, same nature as God, not just like a likeness of it, or a substitute for it, but the same exact nature of glory that God has, Jesus is asking for, that would make Jesus God. And I point this out because there's so many people that you'll probably run into that'll just say, well, Jesus never said he was God or never declared that he was God. And I mean, all you have to do is read, read the red, <laughs> and it's everywhere. <laughs> I mean, that was, old, that was Jesus' point of coming, saying, I am God and I'm dying for you. To save you. So moving on in verse 6. I have manifested your name to the men who, who you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me. And they have received them. And have known surely that I came forth from you. And they have believed that you sent me. See, Jesus now is going to shift from praying for himself. Again, he prays for the Lord to glorify him and to bring him back to his right hand. And now he shifts from himself and he's going to pray for his disciples, his 11 disciples specifically here. Um, we'll also see later on that in the chapter that he's going to pray for all believers. And so a lot of this stuff that he says here is actually, even though he's specifically right now praying for his disciples, the 11 He's also pr going to be praying this for us. Which again, I said at the beginning, we should pray for ourselves, but let's not get too out of hand. We should also pray for others. But what I think is interesting when he says these few verses here is he never laid claim to the disciples. He says they're mine, but only because God has given them to him. And like a good shepherd, he took care of the sheep the Father gave to him. Which is, again, very, very interesting, very humble. You know, one thing that we see throughout the Gospels is Jesus never came in and exerted rule over anyone. Not even his disciples. His disciples really wanted that. They wanted Jesus to come in, kick down the door of the Romans and say, this is my kingdom now. You will bow down to me. Now one day he will. Every day, one day, or every night, one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Whether they want to or not. But honestly, Jesus is giving a great example for pastors. This is the heart that every pastor should have for his flock. He says, they're not mine, they're yours. And, it, and you know, and, and nowadays, um, you know, people in the church are not property of anyone but God. They're God's children, not Nick's children, not <laughs> Billy Graham's children, Greg Glory's children. but they're God's children. And, and it's, it's unfortunate that there, there are churches, denominations, where the pastor has sole authority over the sheep. You know, if you, if you want to get married, you have to go ask the pastor. If you want to buy a new car, you have to go ask the pastor if that's okay. You know, if, if, if you're struggling, maybe, maybe you're struggling to make ends meet and... and and you are like, look, I, I can't tithe every week. You have to go to the pastor. And if the pastor says you need to continue tithing, well, guess what? You need to continue tithing. But see, Jesus never, that was, that's not an example of Jesus at all. There's really no example like that, good example like that in the Bible. Honestly, I don't know where they, they get these things from. They're not reading their Bible. But the people of the church are not the property of anyone but God. 
Paul, however, in the New Testament does bring up the fact that as a pastor of of a church, you're going to have to answer to how you shepherd the flock given to him by God. Again, you know, one day I will have to answer for how I shepherded the flock. You know, because they're not mine. If I had to answer to someone, then if I didn't have to answer to someone, then I mean, you'd be mine. (laughs) You know? Good thing I'm not God, right? <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> but honestly, these verses should be the heart of every pastor and minister of the gospel. And, and again, that's not just, I say minister of the gospel because we're all ministers of the gospel. And the people are not ours. The words are not ours. And the glory, but the glory is his. He says, they were yours. You gave them to me and they kept your word. He says in verse 8, For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them. Again, even Jesus says, Look, the words that I said are not mine. I didn't come up with this, but they're simply what you've given me, Lord, to give to them. They received them. And again, it's the same thing with us. For me up here as a pastor, for you guys living your lives, being ministers of the gospel, the words, because the gospel is not ours even though it's been given to us as a gift. The gospel is Jesus Christ. It's God's, given to us to share with others. There's no way we could have ever come up with the gospel as wicked human beings. Because what we come up with, and we see it in, in all throughout the world, is works-based. Because it's in our nature to try and be better than others. To try and put others below us and put ourselves ahead of others. But see, the gospel evens out that playing field. The gospel puts everyone in the same playing field, which is low. And the only way to be lifted up is to accept Christ. They're not our words. They're not our actions. They're not our people. But what the important thing is, and as Jesus points out here, is that the glory is his. Verse 9. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Again, now Jesus is going to get even specific and, and pray for these 11 disciples and talk about what they've done. And he states that he is leaving, but again, he cares so much for them because he knows the struggles and trials that await them. He, sa- he said earlier, you guys are going to scatter. You guys are just going to go once, I, once I'm arrested. But he also knows that they're about to carry the most important message that the world has ever heard. And even Jesus knew that was a weighty matter. Even Jesus preps his disciple with prayer. Even Jesus told them, hey, don't go out until you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And then go out in the book of Acts. How much more so should we feel that way? Should we be praying, prepping to share the gospel? to be asked to be filled with the Spirit to share the gospel. Oh, I know it. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And so I'll just sing that song to someone. And that'll be good enough. Again, that's going away from the experiential knowledge of God and going to the, well, I know it up here. And that's good enough. And I'll just regurgitate what I've heard. Anyone can do that. So because he cares for them, because he knows the trials and struggles, and he knows what, the, what their purpose is, he prays for them. One of the things that he prays for the disciples is that they would be one. This is interesting. Jesus specifically desires that his disciples would have unity. Again, I mean, he could have prayed for anything. He could have prayed that his disciples had the ability to walk on water. <laughs> That his disciples would be rich. That his disciples would be healthy. That his disciples would enjoy life. 
that his disciples would have a great worship band. That they would speak eloquently. You know, don't, Lord, we know that Peter's kind of awkward. So, I mean, can you just like work out his words sometimes? Because sometimes he's a little rough around the edges. No, he doesn't. He prays for unity. He knows that what they're about to face, they cannot face alone. And so he says, Lord, make them one. Make them one. That they would be one as we are. And again, that's not saying the same nature of unity as the, the Son and the Father, but the same closeness. Again, as Jesus was constantly you know, relying on the Father. Doing, walking with the Father. They would have the same kind of unity, the same bond of unity as they go out into this world. Now, while Jesus was here on this earth, we know that his main goal was glorifying the Father, and he wanted to keep his disciples, as he says, in the name, in the character of God. He says in verse 12, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. He's talking about, again, the name, the character of God. And that should be our goal in this life. The only reliance we should have is upon God and his righteousness. We... That was Jesus' main goal for his disciples, to preach God's righteousness, to preach God's holiness, to preach God's character, and to keep them centered in that. Again, he doesn't train, right, this is how you speak to people, this is how you work miracles. You know, if you really want to reach the people of Samaria, you've got to make sure you look like this and act this way, and you've got to have these kinds of programs. And I say that because that's what the church does today. Hey, if you really want to reach the young generation, you got to do this, and it's all marketing. You got to go to marketing school and business school, and you know, um, maybe if you get a chance, you can have a Bible study every now and then. Um, but no, Jesus says, "Focus." I just kept them in, in who you are. Besides one, Judas Iscariot, that the Scripture might be fulfilled. The only disciple that did not continue is Judas, but we know that's because of a prophecy fulfilled in Psalm 41.9 that David, David mentions. Of Judas betraying Jesus. Let's move on, verse 13. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. In these verses, we really have one of the greatest and often forgotten desires of our Lord Jesus for his disciples. See, Jesus is leaving, and he tells God what, what he has left with his disciples. His word. He doesn't, again, doesn't leave them with the ability to do miracles. The ability to, to speak real well. Doesn't leave them with looking good. And he leaves them with one thing. He says it, your word, God's word. Not his enthusiasm or self-esteem, but his word. This is important because as he states in the following verses, the world is going to be against them because they are his. The greatest foundation and weapon we have as believers when the world is against us is the word of God. But why would Jesus let us go up against the world, right? Right? He loves us. Why wouldn't he just save us from the bad stuff? Why, why would we even need to go into war? Well, in verse 15, he actually prays to the Father that he does not wish that we would be taken out of the world in all of its troubles, but that God would keep us from the evil one. And later in verse 17, he says he wants God to sanctify us 
by his word. See, some Christians want to live a life of escapism. You know, they know Christ is coming back and they know that this isn't it and that this world is wicked and horrible. But they really just want the Lord to get them out of here and so they sit on their hands as if they're waiting for a train to come without knowing the time that it will come. Kind of foolish. Yes, Christ said he's coming back, and it could be at any moment. It could be right now. One of these days. I've always said, you know, no man knows the day or the hour, but, I mean, if you guess every day, one of the days will be right. (laughs) I wouldn't recommend doing that. But some Christians live a life of escapism. We're not of this world, and so we're completely not of this world. Sometimes we pray so much for the Lord to get us out of here, we forget what's going on here. We lose sight of of why we're here. Just as Paul said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. He goes, but it's better that I'm here for your sakes. Yeah, Paul says, any day I'd take heaven over this place. (laughs) But there's a reason I'm not in heaven right now. It's because God has me here for a purpose. And since Jesus left this earth, he has given a purpose for all of his disciples. Matthew 28, we know it, the Great Commission, to go out into all the world and make disciples. But again, it's interesting that what he says he leaves with them is the word, and what he says is that we depend upon his word. And he says in verse... In verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. To be sanctified simply means to grow closer to the Lord and grow in the experiential knowledge of Him. In Psalm 119.9, it says, How can a man cleanse his way? By a program. By taking heed according to your word. How can, you know, I'm struggling with this sin. I'm, I, I just, I can't. By taking heed according to your word. That's how we're cleansed. That's how we're purified. That's how we're sanctified. That's how we grow. In the Bible, the Bible, the word, is constantly referred to as food. Which is really the best example because we cannot live this life physically without eating. Without sustenance. Right? When you have little kids, you tell them, why why do I got to eat my dinner? So you can grow. You know, if you if, when you had a baby, you know, and you had to take them to the doctor, um, they have like when they're really young, they have like monthly checkups, you know, and especially so three months, six months, nine, all that stuff. And the reason they do that is the doctor wants to make sure that the baby is getting enough sustenance. You know, well, hey, here's he's six months old, and so this is the weight they're supposed to be. Well, they're below that weight. You're not feeding them enough. So here, you need to do this, you need to do that. And it's the same with us as believers. Some of us have been believers for years, but we're we're in the weight category of a six-month-old. Because we're not taking in the Word, we're not growing. As Paul said, you know, some, some desire just the like babies, they just desire the milk of the word. Which is just the simple stuff. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. He goes, but he says, well, you guys should be chewing on the meat of the word. The good stuff. The stuff that's going to grow you, give you protein, make you strong. See, Jesus wants us as his disciples to depend on his word as we walk through this life. In Ephesians 6, Paul says that the word is a sword. And here, Jesus says that he sends us out with that sword. And you know, it's just like, I mean, swords can be heavy, right? 
Um, I, I remember growing up, I had a friend that was really into like Lord of the Rings and all these like fancy movies and stuff. And so he was really into collecting swords, replica swords of from these different movies and stuff. And I remember um, uh, he got the sword from Braveheart. He really liked that movie. And I was like 12, I think, when he got it. And, um, you know, I was like, this is, this is, you know, I'm a 12-year-old boy, and there's a sword. Like, this is the coolest thing that's ever happened. So, you know, I get it, and I, I try swinging the thing, and I'm like, what in the world? It's heavy. It takes a lot of strength to do that, especially to be like riding a horse and swinging that thing in battle and, you know, trying to balance, and people are trying to get you to. <laughs> it's not easy. You have to train. You have to be strengthened. But see, as Jesus has told the Israelites, or as God told the Israelites in the Old Testament, I've given them into your hand. The victory is already yours. Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew 16, 18, a very similar thing. I mean, because again, it can be intimidating. The world's up against us. It's us against the world. Jesus is leaving. And all we have is this book to some that might be intimidating. Well, Jesus says in Matthew 16, 18, and I also say to you that you are Peter, speaking to Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I mean, the victory is already ours as believers. We've defeated death. What, what can, no one can do anything else to us. Death's been defeated. The sting, you know, Oh, death, where is your sting? And Jesus has given us that mission, and he is the perfect example to follow because he came down into this world on a mission from the Father, and the world hated him enough to put him to death on a cross for no reason. They just wanted to kill him. They didn't like him. Verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be as one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Now, in these verses, Jesus pretty much repeats what he has already prayed, except now, instead of praying specifically for the 11 disciples, he prays for anyone that is going to one day believe in him to be his disciple. Which I think is encouraging. He has the same desire for you and me that he had for the original 11 apostles who would found the church and start churches everywhere and one day be martyred for their faith. We're not viewed as like second class Christians because we're in 2017 and we read our Bibles on our phones. No, he has that same desire for us. And this should also greatly encourage us because here we see that Jesus is praying for us. Us, specifically. To know that the Lord and creator of the universe didn't just die for my sins and gave me new life, but is also thinking about me enough to pray for me while I'm here on this earth. I mean, I could just imagine right now, Jesus, as he's praying, he's like, look, I'm not, Lord, I'm not just praying for these 11 guys in front of me. They need prayer, trust me. But now, now he's getting a vision, a glimpse into the rest of the future and all the disciples that are going to come after him. And he says, Lord, he sees all the wickedness that's going to happen, the things happening in our world. And he prays for us. In Romans 8, 34, Paul says, Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. I mean, he's speaking to the Lord. And all, no, they're good. They're mine. Look at this. My blood has covered them. 
They're perfect. They're righteous. In Hebrews 7.25, Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Christ is making intercession for us, praying for us. He's on our side. (laughs) And then again, as he mentioned before, unity. He mentions it again. He wants everyone to know that it's by our unity with one another that it's a witness to the world that Jesus Christ is the true Lord and Savior. And if we're being honest, you ask some people, hey, you want to come to church? Or if you heard about Jesus, about God, they're like, why? This church hates that church across the street, and apparently they believe the same thing. Why? Why would I join a dysfunctional family like that? It's okay to have our our different ways of doing church if they're biblically based. That's one thing I love about about God is how he does, Jesus in the Bible, when he describes church, when he describes what it's supposed to be like, it's very bare bones. It's just Christians getting together, encouraging one another by the teaching of his word, by praying together, and by lifting his name high. That's it. So if you want to do that by sitting in pews, singing hymns, dressing up real nice, praise the Lord. If you want to show up in in flip-flops, barefoot, grungy clothes, with a 12-man, you know, stage, and, and but that's your purpose, good for you. Praise the Lord. Maybe you like it on Saturdays. Good for you. Praise the Lord. But see, the problem is, is a lot of us, we think, well, this is the way to do it. This is the way it has to be done. And if you're not doing it this way, then you're wrong. And, and then you're like, hey, do you want to come to our church? That's the wrong church. And people are like, what? <laughs> what? I got saved to that church. Now you're telling me it's the wrong. You know, just Jesus Christ's desire for his church is unity. Because he could see that we would not be unified. He wouldn't say that if we were going to be unified. But he knew. I mean, he, he had with the 11 disciples, were they ever unified? Not really. That's why he prayed for it twice. For his 11 disciples and for the rest of the world, that they would be unified in him. I mean, Jesus even lived that example when the disciples are all mad about other people saying that they're, you know, from Jesus and with Jesus. Jesus is like, that's it. I didn't invite them in. They're not doing it our way. Let's go get them. Lightning bolts. James, John, call down fire. Let's go. No, he says, if they're, if they're not against us, that means they're for us. Yeah, they're doing it a little differently. But my name's being glorified. My father's name is being glorified. Paul says the same thing. He goes, hey, you know, I might not like like the way that they do this, but I can glory glory in this, that the name of Christ is being preached. And again, that's hard for us because we get like really into our church. And and I'm not saying it's not, it's not, it's bad to like be proud of your church, like in what they're doing and stuff. But like, we need to be careful because we can offend, wrongfully offend Other believers who do it differently, but they're glorifying God. And then what kind of witness is that to that coworker? When you you go up to your coworker's desk and be like, oh, so you guys wear suits at church? Are you guys even Christians? And then, hey, you want to come to our church? We don't wear suits. Like, if I wanted to wear a suit, would you judge me? (laughs) Maybe I want to wear a suit at church. Again, we need to be careful. God, Jesus' desire for us is unity. And that's based, again, as he's been saying, that's based upon his word. Not just unity in things, but see, the center of it has to be his word. The center of it has to be his word. The foundation of it has to be his word. He now closes out his prayer in verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me 
may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and I will, and will declare it, that the love which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. He closes his prayer right now with his desire that they would be with him forever in heaven. That's the whole point of salvation. In the garden, our perfect relationship with the Father was severed by sin, and we could no longer commune with God. Now Jesus has taken the consequences of our sin, which as Paul says in Romans is death, the wages of sin is death, that, so that whosoever believes in him can have eternal life with him. This is, Jesus ends his prayer by saying, Lord, this was the point of me coming down here, of glorifying your name, of doing all this, was to bring them back into fellowship with you and I. And so, Lord, let's do that. He was not leaving his disciples to never see them again, but he promised them everlasting life with them. And he did all this for the Father, for the glory of the Father. So in closing this morning, if you are his disciple, then you should take courage that the Lord your God has prayed for you and is praying for you. Constantly lives to make intercession for us. And he wants you to stand upon his truth, his word. That's how we grow. That's how we're sanctified. That's how we know him more. And he's given us a purpose in this life and it's not just to wait, but to go out and he has, and he has given us the power to do it. He tells us to go out, but he, he gives us the sword. He gives us the spirit. He's walked the path before us. He's the example to us. And so as his believers this morning, we have that example. And we see that Jesus Christ won. The victory is already ours. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. But if this morning you are not his disciple, then let me encourage you that the creator of the universe did all of this for you so that you could have a relationship with him. But because of your sin, you cannot have that relationship the good news is that he died for our sins and three days later he defeated the one thing that every man deserves, the wages of sin is death, but no man can be. To inherit this eternal life, all you have to do is believe on the name of Jesus Christ. Just believe on him. And so, this morning, I, you know, again, what a great prayer. Notice there is no, um, if you have a red letter Bible, which if you do or don't, don't matter. But if you do, you'll notice there's no Black letters in between the start of this prayer and the end. The disciples kept their mouths shut. I thought that was kind of interesting because uh, normally they don't. You know, Jesus lifts up his eyes to heaven and starts praying. You, you start listening. <laughs> and I think that's important that even in our prayer life, we need to be listening. And so, Lord, I thank you so much just for um, the example you've set to all of us. Lord, that you're praying for us, that you live to make intercession for us, that you're on our side, that you've given us everything we need in this life to live, Lord. And Lord, even as you prayed, Lord, I pray that you wouldn't take us out of the trials, but you, that you would get us through the trials. Lord, that we would not live a life of escapism, but live a life of purpose that you've given us. Live a life focused on you and your word, on unity with one another, because that's, that's one of the biggest witnesses we have to this world, is that we're unified. And the world loves it when we, when we are in, in disunity and, and dissension, Lord, because it's just another reason not to believe in their eyes. Lord, let us, not be, let us not give them reasons not to believe. Let us give them all the reasons to believe. By the conduct of our lives, by the words from our mouths, Lord. I pray you would fill us with your spirit as we leave this place, Lord. And if, Lord, if there's anyone here who does not know you, Lord, they would not leave this place without being reconciled to their Savior, Lord. I pray your Holy Spirit would work upon their hearts. It's in your name we pray.